Greetings, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this edition of the August Foundations Lecture Series with CMSMC. My name is Christine Staten, and I am very pleased to present to you two seminal texts by Giorgio Vasari on technique and the lives of the artists. These texts are foundational to the field of art history, and Vasari is often considered the first art historian. They are essential reading to any student of the Italian early modern period, and indeed any person interested in Western art history in general. As we will learn today, the lives set several ideas about art history and the Renaissance that we still maintain today. Despite this, these texts are rarely encountered by students outside of the, inter uh, outside of the Italian early modern period until they take a graduate level methodologies course. This lecture, provides background information for on technique and the lives, including their historical context, structure, and content, which students can carry into seminar discussions. Our goals today are to understand the historical context and significance of Giorgio Vasari's texts to early modern art history and to art history as a discipline, to become familiar with the structure and content of on technique and the lives, and to gain the confidence to study, analyze, discuss, and employ the text in your graduate studies. Giorgio Vasari was born in Arezzo, a small town in the province of the Florentine Republic on the 30th of July, 1511, to a family of artisans. He trained as a painter and a goldsmith in Florence and in Arezzo, starting in around 1524. He traveled and worked widely throughout the Italian peninsula, and over the course of his career, he was regularly patronized by Grand Duke Cosimo I de' Medici. Vasari Augur saw an impressive and efficient workshop of artisans, which produced some of the most conspicuous works of art in Florence. I include in this presentation a number of works that I believe you should be most concerned with. The facade of the Uffizi galleries, the fresco cycle in the Salone del Cinquecento in the Palazzo Vecchio, the fresco cycle of the Last Judgment in the Cathedral's Dome, and Michelangelo's burial monument in the church of Santa Croce. I reiterate, these are just the prominent Florentine examples. Vasari's artworks can be seen in Venice, Rome, and many other places in Italy. I would encourage you to look them up if you are so inclined. Additionally, Vasari helped to establish the first art academy, the Accademia del Disegno in Florence in 1563. Vasari died in 1574 and is buried in his hometown of Arezzo. The lives of the most excellent painters, sculptors, and architects, or lives of the artist, as we often call it by its shortened name, is a large collection of artist biographies divided into three parts with a preface to each part. The three parts of the lives are structured in roughly chronological order, tracing the progress of artistic development throughout the Italian peninsula from the 13th century to Vasari's own time, the early to mid 16th century. On Technique is a collection of methods, instructions, and descriptions of various artistic techniques and materials from painting and sculpture and beyond. It was published as a preface to the lives. Vasari's text is dependent on Cennino Cennini's the, Craftsman Hand the Craftsman's Handbook of the previous century. I would recommend studying this work as well, as it is a great, so uh, great source to understand artistic training and workshop production in the early modern period. Comparing it to Vasari's manual, we can learn how knowledge and techniques changed and developed between the two publications. The Lives is quite novel in, uh, and innovative in many ways. There were chronicles of artists' lives and areas of specialization already in existence by the time that Vasari wrote his text, most notably Lorenzo Ghiberti's commentaries. And there are several others, but I would refer you to Michael Baxendahl's book, Painting and Experience in 15th Century Italy, to learn more. Baxendahl did an excellent job contextualizing and explaining many of the chronicles uh, in the century before Vasari. But the lives is remarkable in the extent of the biographies. Some include family histories and trainings, and most of them discuss specific works of art, commissions, and more. What is truly special about the lives is Vasari's evaluation of the art and the artists. He discusses which artists are truly the most talented and made the most quote unquote beautiful artwork. He uses the word beautiful a lot and where the bo their body of work may have been found wanting. What's most important for you to know as a graduate student in the history of art or in material culture is that Vasari set ideas of artistic development, 
value and the very idea of art having a renaissance in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. I have just a few words to say about the context of the work and its general structure, and then we'll unpack a few of those values, which I hope will lend greatly to a seminar discussion this year. The Lives is dedicated to Grand Duke Cosimo I of Florence, and you can see the Medici coat of arms at the top of this frontispiece. The first edition was published in the year 1550, and an expanded second edition was published in 1568. It's notable that particularly in the second edition, Vizzotti refers to various sources. Vizzotti gathered stories and anecdotes from supposedly trusted sources and compiled them into his collection of biographies. The book is divided into three parts. The first part discusses artists of the roughly 13th and 14th centuries, including Cimabue, Giotto, Simone Martini, and Duccio. The preface to the first part of the lives and the lives in general praises art which in, uh, imitates nature and, cl and claims that the ancient Greco-Romans achieved superiority in artistic creation because of their capability to imitate the beauty of nature. He describes artistic creation as having peaks and valleys in its sophistication. The Greeks and Romans achieved this peak, and after the fall of Rome and the formation of the new Christian church, artistic production suffered because of Christianity's refusal of anything pagan. It is with the artists that he discusses in the following chapters, particularly Giotto, that art had a rebirth and a renewed interest in nature, and as he calls it, the state of perfection. The second part chronicles the lives of certain artists of the 15th century, notably Ghiberti, Brunelleschi, Donatello, Botticelli, Fra Angelico, and Masaccio. While Vizzotti reserves the highest praise for the artists of the third part, he concedes that these artists of the second part made great improvements in design, style, and accuracy. He discusses innovations in painting, sculpture, and architecture, each in their own turn, stating that, quote, painting made more obvious progress than the other two arts, unquote. Vizzotti repeats his praise of Giotto, describing the period in which he lived as a period of artistic poverty to which Giotto contributed more liveliness and emotional qualities in his figures. It is also noteworthy that Vizzotti claims that it was the painter Masaccio who first abandoned the style of Giotto and gave birth to the modern style of painting. According to Vasari, the artists of the second part produced what he saw in nature, but went no further. He says, quote, in this way, their work came to be more highly regarded and better understood. And this gave them the courage to establish rules for perspective and to make their foreshortenings exactly like the proper forms of natural relief. They did this so well that it can be boldly declared that these arts were not only improved, but were brought to the flower of their youth, giving promise and bearing fruits to follow and in a short while of reaching their age of perfection, unquote. The Lives culminates in part three with the biographies of artists of the late 15th and early 16th centuries, including such recognizable names as Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and Michelangelo. These are the artists, according to Vasari, who reached complete perfection in their work. Interestingly, Vasari praises these artists for being able to produce works not only in great quality, but in quantity as well. And this seems perfectly logical to me at least, because Vasari's own workshop was known to produce many works very efficiently. The hero of Vasari's text overall is Michelangelo Buonarroti, whom Vasari deems the divine, the greatest in all three arts at the same time. Michelangelo has surpassed the abilities of the ancients, and for this he earns Vasari's epithet as a gift from God. Um, in your courses, I think you'll be asked most likely to just read the three prefaces, and you might read a biography here and there, depending on your instructor. If you can read just the first couple pages of Michelangelo's biography, it is the longest in the whole text, but just read the beginning of Michelangelo's. It's quite a treat. Okay, so that's the basic structure of the lives. So the significance of this work. To reiterate, the significance of Fazzotti's lives is in the very idea of a rebirth of art during the 15th and 16th centuries. 
Scholars before Vasari, including Petrarch, had already noticed the renewed interest in the literature of the Greco-Roman world, but it is Vasari who established our modern ideas about the visual arts. Vasari also contributed to our modern ideas of evaluating artworks based on beauty, technique, and the skill of the artist. And overall, we still maintain today that there is a clear progression in artistic development and improvement over time, a scale of peaks and valleys that can be traced through the history of art in the West. Two central themes to be aware of when you study the work of Vasari, particularly the lives, is first the debate between design and colore, and the relationship between artist and patron. As a Florentine, Vasari has a clear bias towards design or disegno, which emphasizes drawing and drafting artworks. And we also learn a great deal about the relationships between artists and their patrons. As you likely know, in the early modern period, artists were dependent on patronage in order to create their artwork. If you're interested in learning even more about patronage from a firsthand perspective, I would recommend Benvenuto Cellini's autobiography to you. Now a few notes on using Vasari. Vasari's stories and anecdotes about the lives of these artists are overall rather enjoyable and at times charming to read. He adds a sense of humanity to these grand mythical figures in art history, while at the same time perpetuating the rising status of the artist in society from craftsman to genius. Please note, however, that Vasari does not refer to his subjects as artists. He calls them according to their area of specialization, painters, sculptors, and architects. This reminds us that the role of the uh, quote unquote artist continued to develop beyond Vasari's time to what we think of today. Now, when studying and using Vasari's lives in your graduate school papers, remember to approach it with care. While Vasari does refer to reliable sources by our modern standards, they prove sometimes unreliable, and many of the accounts are apocryphal or totally unfounded. Vasari famously describes Leonardo's Mona Lisa, relying on the descriptions of others as the painting was in France and Vasari had never seen it himself, so the description is a little off. So when you read the biographies included in the lives, take them with a grain of salt. That being said, this is a great primary resource and a starting point for your research. It can tell you what was known about certain artists and their body of work in the mid 16th century, which could be invaluable to your research. And one final note regarding On Technique is of a similar vein. On Technique records what was known and understood about certain materials and how they were used in the 16th century. In my own experience, I used On Technique when studying ancient Egyptian sculptures in Renaissance Rome, and Vasati's account of granite and porphyry confirmed that early modern scholars knew that these materials came from Egypt. And that is all I have to share with you about Giorgio Vasati's lives and On Technique. I hope this lecture was both informational and enjoyable to watch. Best of luck in your graduate studies and happy reading. <laughs>